There's some big questions that we've been looking at, that we've been considering, and uh, today we're going to consider why do good people do bad things? So let's read Romans 7, starting at verse 7. What then shall we say? That the law is sin? By no means. Yet if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin, for I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said, you shall not covet. But sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me all kinds of covetous, covetousness. For apart from the law, sin lies dead. I want, was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin came alive and I died. The very commandment that promised life proved to be death to me. For sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me, and through it killed me. So the law is holy, and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. Did that which is good then bring death to me? By no means. It was sin producing death in me through what is good, in order that sin might be shown to be sin, and that through the commandment might become sinful beyond measure. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold under sin. For I do not understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh, for I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in my members another law, waging a war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. Paul is talking about wrestling with his sinful nature here. And it's kind of a complicated passage, and uh, there's actually some debate about it. But I want to say a couple things before we say much about this passage here. In the strict sense of the word good, nobody is good. All of us are sinful, and we've all turned away from God. So in Romans 3... 10 through 18, it says, As it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God. All have turned aside, together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood, and their paths are ruined in misery. In the way of peace, they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. And this describes all of us. We've, we have all sinned and we are all sinners. And so none of us is truly good, at least in the proper sense of good. Only God himself is good. That's it. God is good in every sense of the word. And we do not measure up to that standard. So even when uh, the rich young man comes up to Jesus and says, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus says, why do you call me good? There's only one good, and that's God. And so Jesus is saying to this young man here, you're, you're calling me good. This is quite a, quite a high standard. Do you, do you know who I really am? There's only God who is good. And we believe that Jesus was God, so he was perfectly good. 
But human beings are not. Human beings are not good in that way. All people have a sin nature. All of us. Every last one of us has a nature that goes away from God and doesn't really want God, or if it does, we want him on our terms and not his. We don't really love God. We kind of love him just for the good stuff that he can give us. You know, we want, we want to go to heaven and we want him to, be, to give us, you know, health and comforts and stuff in life, but, but we don't really necessarily love God for who he is. Or at least that's our, in our nature. And that's what this passage is talking about here. Paul is talking about the way he wrestles with his own sin nature. When I want to do good, evil is right there with me. When I, even when I do good deeds, I find selfishness there. I find pride. I do good deeds because I'm a good person or because I want to get something back. And so, even when we're doing good, there's still some mixed motives in there. So, even the Apostle Paul continued to battle his sinful nature. Now, I do want to put a little note here saying that there, are, there is some debate about this passage. There's some different ways that people understand it. But one of the main ways is that this is Paul wrestling with his sinful nature and saying, what a wretched man I am who will rescue me from this body of death. Thanks be to God so that we are rescued from our sinful nature. One day, we will have new bodies. We believe that our, our soul, when we die, our soul goes to be with the Lord. But then when Jesus comes back, our souls will be reunited with our bodies and we will rise again. And so we will be rescued from this sinful nature. So let's look here at uh, the screen and let's answer this together. In the Apostles' Creed, we talk about the forgiveness of sins. What do you believe concerning the forgiveness of sins? I believe that God, because of Christ's atonement, will never hold against me any of my sins, nor my sinful nature, which I need to struggle against all my life. Rather, in His grace, God grants me the righteousness of Christ to free me forever from judgment. You notice where it says there, God will never hold against me any of my sins, nor my sinful nature, which I need to struggle against all my life. This is going to be an ongoing thing for all of us, as it was for the Apostle Paul himself. We're always going to have to struggle with this sinful nature here. So that even our righteous acts, even our best acts are like filthy rags. There's a verse in Isaiah 64 that says it that way. We have all become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment. So even when we are doing good, we have those mixed motives there. We have that selfishness. We have pride among other things perhaps. And so we can never be truly good on our own. We need God always. And as he says in verse 21, So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. So even our best acts are still polluted. They still fall short. So, in other words, we have this sinful nature. And we're always going to have it until Christ comes again and we are redeemed and our bodies are made new. So as we have this sinful nature, <clears throat> even the best of us here, there's, there's a kind of a phrase that comes to my mind quite often to describe what's going on in, in myself or, or others. And it's all of us are capable of all kinds of evil. Because we have a sin nature, and that's always there, and we've got to struggle against, us, against it, there's always that capacity for all kinds of evil in every one of us. We might not like to think about that, but I know that even just looking back in my life, I've been surprised at what I've been capable of doing. I never thought I'd be capable of doing that. 
but I did. And I've known a lot of other people. I'd never really thought that so-and-so would do something like that, but they did. And so this is kind of a, a helpful maxim for me. All of us are capable of all kinds of evil. If you look at the Bible, all the great saints of the Bible fell into terrible sins. All of them. Years back, I did a whole sermon series on perfect people, and I went through all of the key heroes of faith, and we we looked at their failings and how these people were not good on their own. It's not because that they were wonderful people. It's because of what God did through them and because of their, their faith. So if you look back in the Bible, Abraham... He basically prostituted his wife Sarah to Pharaoh so that he could get lots of goods from Pharaoh and so that he could have this sense of security. There's a story about that. A lot of us know about King David. David had an affair with a married woman and when she became pregnant, he arranged for the husband to be accidentally killed in battle. That was David. How about the Apostle Peter? Peter denied that he knew Jesus three times when just moments before he had promised Jesus, even if all fall away from you, I never will. And Jesus said, yeah, well, you're going to disown me three times this very night before the rooster crows. And he says, well, even if I have to die with you, I would never disown you. Well, it wasn't that long. And he did. When Jesus was arrested, all the disciples deserted him and fled. At the Last Supper, all of the disciples, they were still arguing about who was the greatest, even at the Last Supper, it says. They still were very selfish there. So, we have a lot of precedent in the Bible for people of faith who do some pretty awful things. But even for people who don't take the Bible as God's word, there is a lot of evidence out there to demonstrate our sinful nature. A lot. I had to cut a lot of this short even just so that I can mention some of these things. Studies show that kind people can quickly become brutal in certain situations. If you put people... In the right situation, they can change pretty quick. There's something that maybe some of you heard called the Stanford Prison Experiment. That was done in 1971 by a professor named Philip Zimbardo. He took 24 people, he tested them, and he found that that they were psychologically balanced people. They were not unstable. And he had them, who were volunteers, he said, we're going to do a two-week prison simulation. So he randomly selected 12 to be guards and 12 to be prisoners. The guards were given uniforms, billy clubs, whistles. They were told to enforce the rules, and they were told not to use violence. Prisoners were given prison garb. They had a chain around one ankle, and they were locked in cells. The first day, everybody was kind of, you know, thought this was kind of goofy and fun and, you know, they were kind of having fun with it. But after the first day, things started to change. The guards began forcing prisoners to do some pretty difficult things to try to enforce the rules. They had them exercise for long periods of time. They forced them to use a bucket for a bathroom They refused to let prisoners empty that bucket. They removed the mattresses so that they had to sleep on the cold concrete. They forced them to go around naked. Just stuff like that. And by day six, it got so out of hand that he said, we can't finish the two weeks. We've got to stop it right now. These were regular people who turned out to be pretty brutal and merciless. And uh, this professor said the most dramatic and distressing to us was the observation 
of the ease with which sadistic behavior could be elicited in individuals who are not sadistic types. People who are not sadistic can quickly become sadistic if you put them in the right situation. Ordinary people can easily be turned into killers. Very easily. A little too easily. The picture here on the screen is a Reserve Police Battalion 101 in um, Nazi-occupied Poland. They were 500 middle-aged, working-class men from a place that was not really receptive to Nazism. They were educated and spent their formative years before Hitler came to power. They were not indoctrinated in the Nazi system. And they were instructed one day to round up a bunch of Jews and kill them all. And their commanding officer said, okay, this is going to be a tough assignment, so I'm going to let anybody who wants step out. You don't have to do this. This is going to be pretty awful. We're going to have to shoot women and children here. And of 500, 10 stepped out. As they were given more detailed instructions about what they were going to do, a couple more stepped out. When the shooting started, a couple more stepped out. But at the end of the day, about 1,500 elderly women and children were all shot dead. And about 80% spent the whole day shooting. These are regular people not indoctrinated in the Nazi propaganda and they became cold-blooded killers. And even the people who backed out didn't back out because of moral qualms. They didn't say, I, this is against my values, I can't do this. They talked about how they, were, they had too weak of a stomach for doing it. And over time, this group became some very efficient killers. And the book that I read about it said this, Modern governments that wish to commit mass murder will seldom fail in their efforts for being unable to induce ordinary men to become willing executioners. And this was demonstrated. There's a guy by the name of Stanley Milgram. There's a picture of him. He did a bunch of experiments. And uh, he had a bunch of volunteers come and he told them, we're going to have a study on the effect of punishment on learning. So what we're going to do is I'm going to have somebody who's going to be a learner and we're going to strap them up to an electric chair and every time they get an answer wrong, you're to administer an electric shock. And every time they get an answer wrong, you've got to put it up just a little bit more. So we've got to see if, if pain is going to help them in their learning. This is what they were told. The person in the electric chair was actually an actor. So nobody was actually being harmed. So on this electric shock thing here, it started at very low amount of, amount of volts, but it went all the way up to 450 volts. And the people who were told to go higher each time, many of them did. Many of them went all the way to 450 volts. Even while this actor was screaming crying, begging for their life, saying that they had a heart condition, and so forth. It didn't matter. About 65% of them went all the way to the top. Simply because they were told to. And this professor concluded, he was on 60 Minutes. This, they did a big thing on this. He said, if a system of death camps were to be set up in the United States of the sort we had in Nazi Germany, 
one would be able to find sufficient personnel for those camps in any medium-sized American town. You could easily find people. So, this sort of stuff here, this is, this is not even from the Bible. We have a sin nature. And if you put us in the right situation, we're capable of all kinds of evil. Stuff that we never would have thought we would have done. So we'd like to think that there are good people out there and that there's bad people, but the truth is, all of us need to pray, lead us not into temptation. There's a reason why that's in the Lord's Prayer. Lead us not into temptation. The man here that's being pictured is a man who was a soldier in um, Soviet Russia during the Stalin administration. And he was in the war and did a bunch of awful things. And then he said something against Stalin and then he was put in one of their gulags for 10 years or so. And he wrote a massive book that wrote, won the Nobel Prize called The Gulag Archipelago. I highly recommend it. But he, in all of this, has seen a lot of evil. He's committed it, and it's been committed against him. And he said this, If only there were evil people somewhere insidiously committing evil deeds, and it were necessary only to separate them from the rest of us and just destroy them. But the line dividing good and evil cuts through the heart of every human being. There's good and evil, he says, in every one of us. It's not like we can identify all the Nazis or all the racists or all the murderers and put them in a corner and just get rid of them and then we're okay. It doesn't work like that. When you have a sin nature... We are all capable of all kinds of evil. And even more than that, behind many wicked acts are people believing that they're doing good. And indeed, when he said, I was doing a lot of awful things, I actually thought I was doing good. I thought I was on the right side. So he said, in the surfeit of power, I was a murderer and an oppressor, in my most evil moments, I was convinced I was doing good. And I was well supplied with systematic arguments for communism and such. And it was only when I lay there on rotting prison straw that I sensed within myself the first stirrings of good. Gradually it was disclosed to me that the line separating good and evil, he repeats himself here, passes not through states, nor between classes, nor between political parties either, but right through every human heart and through all human hearts. It's not that there's evil people out there that we need to get rid of. All the evil people have good in them too. And there's this mix, and this is every human heart. So a useful phrase to keep us humble as believers here. There but for the grace of God go I. When you see awful people doing awful things on TV, on the news, and so forth, this should be our thought. There but for the grace of God go I. We are not righteous on our own. We are righteous because of Christ. And what He has done through us by the Holy Spirit. If we were put in different circumstances, raised in different homes, educated under different systems, we might be exactly like them. In fact, it's probably safe to say that we would if Christ had not sent us grace. There but for the grace of God go I is a very useful phrase for all of us. But there's good news here. There's good news. Believers in Christ 
can resist sin. We can say no. We can turn away from it. We don't have to follow it. So all people, every one of us, even believers, have a sin nature, but those who belong to Christ are not bound to it. We are not slaves to it. We don't have to obey it. If you have Christ in your life, then you might say, like sometimes it is in some cartoons, you have this little angel here whispering things, and then you have this little devil here. So this is kind of what Paul's talking about in Romans 7. He says there's, there's kind of two laws at work. I, I want to serve God, but I find myself serving the law of sin. So if you don't have Christ, then there's not really much of an angel there speaking to you. But if you do have Christ in your life, then you have somebody else that you can listen to. And so, I do want to put this out there. We as believers, we don't have an excuse for our sin. If we do something egregious or even small, we can't just say, well, my sin nature made me do it or Satan made me do it because when you have Christ, you have an out. We always have an out. That verse that's often stated that God won't give you more that you can handle is really about temptation. God is faithful. He will not give you more temptation than you can bear, but in that moment will give you enough so that you can stand up, out, stand up under it, is how it says. So we can't, we can't make excuses for our sin. If you're a believer, there's no excuse. There's just forgiveness and just grace. That's all. The people from Reserve Battalion 101 and a lot of other people in Nazi Germany, when they are asked about, you know, why did you pull, up, pull the trigger? Why did, you, why did you release gas into the chamber? And they almost always say, I was just following orders. I was doing what I was told to do. That's what they were trained for. But if you follow Christ, you have somebody else. Human beings were originally created to be servants. And so by design, we are always serving something. So in the beginning, when God created Adam and Eve, he created them to work the garden and to care for it. It says God made this creation and then he created Adam and Eve to work that garden and to care for it. We were created to be servants. And so if you don't have Christ, you're going to be looking for something else to serve. And people come up with all kinds of stuff. People serve their country or their business or their family or romantic interest. Sometimes we just serve our own appetites and that's all. But we find something that we serve. That's human nature. We were made to do that. But when Jesus is your Lord, you are free from the control of any other superior. You are not controlled by them anymore. You are not dominated by them because you have a different master now. You don't have to obey your appetites or your boss or a romantic interest or your children in some cases. You can obey the Lord. You can say no. I'm going to obey God and not this. Jesus said, and this is your Bible reading track for today. Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. But if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Jesus sets us free from being slaves to our sin nature. When Jesus is your Lord, you follow someone else instead of the crowd. Following the crowd is a very powerful influence. And the book that was about Reserve Battalion 101 really reinforced that. 
because of those people who stepped out and said, I don't want to shoot any women or children or elderly people, none of them suffered repercussions from above. They were not demoted. They were not picked on. They were not sent to the death camps at all. The only, re the only bad stuff that came to them for that was from their peers who told them that they were weak and they were wimpy, that they didn't have the guts to do it. And they were picked on and demeaned that way. Really, the pressure was from their peers and not from above. But if you follow Jesus, you don't have to follow the crowd. Everybody else could be doing something wrong. And you could stand up because you have a different master. And you could say, I know, I'm going to follow Jesus here. I'm not going to follow all of you. You have something else to follow. When believers do bad things, the real reason is hidden idolatry. When we as believers do something bad, do something wrong, do something that we even know better not to do, the real reason is because we have idols in our hearts somewhere hidden in there. Sometimes we're even good at keeping them from ourselves. But that's the reality of it. As I look into my own heart and I look back at my life and my mistakes, that's what I see. And I hope that you can find that too. We have idols of perhaps desiring to be liked and respected by others. That's a powerful one. Or being corrupted by power. You give somebody power, you can see them get corrupted pretty quick. Or the lure of sex and those lusts of the flesh. Or greed for just a little bit more. I think it was Rockefeller who was asked, you know, how much money do you need to be satisfied? And he said, just a little more. There's always just a little more. And behind every one of these idols is a path of evil acts we would otherwise never do. When you have to serve an idol, whatever it is, how, even the ones that might seem innocent, there's a bunch of things behind that that you will be led to do that otherwise you would never think of doing. Never. And some of that would include some of the awful things that some of these people had to do. Idols are powerful. And so we as believers, we need to look inside ourselves and notice them wherever we see them before we do something truly egregious. So one final thought for you. When Stanley Milgram did that study about the electric shocks, he found that when the person telling the subject to administer a higher shock and keep going up, keep going up. He found that when that person was closer by, that this person was much more likely to go all the way up. So if the person giving you the orders is closer, you're more likely to follow it. So that can work also with Christ. Stay close to Christ. The closer you are to Him, the more likely you are to follow what he says as opposed to what others say. People obey authorities that are closest. So let's stay close to Jesus with the word, with prayer, and with the fellowship of believers. And let's pray. Lord our God, we all have a sin nature. We we recognize that. But Lord Jesus, thank you for giving us another option, something else to follow, so that we do not do the egregious things that we might otherwise do. But Lord, help us to struggle against this sin nature that each one of us hath, so that we can remain humble, and Lord, that we would not fall into the same pits that some of our forefathers have fallen into, that we read about in your word. Help us to follow you, Lord Jesus, and your Holy Spirit. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen.